Welcome everyone. My name is Neil, and welcome to Silver Threads. Our story today delves into the sci-fi realm with some old but reliable technology. Posted by Darkly Gathers. An agent robot works on our family farm. We don't know where he came from, but our grandpa made us promise to keep him a secret. When one pictures a robot, and forgive me here if I've made an assumption, but I feel that one typically pictures something futuristic-like. Flashing lights, shining chrome, beep boop bob, laser beams and antenna and all that. Our boy's nothing like that. He's been on the farm for as long as I can remember. As long as my pa can remember. And my grandpa never told my pa where the robot came from. If he ever even knew himself. All the old man said on the matter was that he'd promised to keep the robot hidden and made us all promise to do the same. And we've kept our promise. Until very recently, our family were the only ones to know about Avtomet. That's his name, Avtomet. What we called him. I'm looking at him right now. I'm watching him play through the mist of the morning, playing a game with my little sister and my little brother. He's a tall boy. Gotta be more than six and a half feet tall by my reckoning. Now, it's tough to describe a man made of steel as ancient, but there's really no other word for him. He's been carrying on without fault or fail for decades now, but Aftomat always looks like he's on the edge of total collapse. I ain't never seen a more rusted piece of machinery in all my days, and as best as Pa tries, can only ever scrub off the surface, Scuzz. The rust goes deep. I shield my eyes from the encroaching drizzle, but Aftermath don't mind it. My siblings certainly don't. He's all beams and springs and gears. You can see him turning as he moves from place to place, whistling and rattling as he does so. We ain't got no idea how Aftermath's powered, and he won't tell us. We've long since given up asking. But back in the early days, he'd only put a segmented, screw-like finger to his mouth and tell my pa that it's a secret. Occasionally, a cloud of steam will burst from the pipes in his waist or his shoulders, but it ain't regular. I watch as he picks up my brother, Fedder, to a squeal of laughter and spins him round in a circle. Me next, shouts Yulia, my sister, jumping up and down through the fog. Me next. My pa fitted Avtomat with a pair of heavy brown leather gloves a few weeks ago. Not sure why he didn't do it earlier to be frank, given the rust on his fingers. Avtomat loves them, but man, if it sure don't make him look goofy. I smile good-naturedly as I catch a flash of them going through the early gray mist. He's a great worker, is Avtomat. Loves to till, never tires of plowing. He's great at fixing, too. Loves to work on the tractors and the combine. Though I swear, every time he's had his hands on them, they seem to work a little differently. Not worse, mind. Just differently. You get used to it. He spots me through the haze. Those cracked, traffic light-esque circles of light of his flash a pleasant aqua green, and he sets my sister down onto the damp field grass. He raises a hand in a wave, gears cranking and clattering as he does so. Good day, Miss Sophia. Care for any assistance with the chickens this morning? I grimace at him. I ain't too keen on being referred to as Miss. I've been a tomboy at heart since I was two, as he well knows. Sophia, as always, is fine, after Matt, I reply. And thank you for the offer, but I'm all good for now. Aftermath nods with a clank and returns to his game with Feder and Yulia. Aftermath likes the fields the best. He'll work with animals on occasion and when asked, but some of them are mighty frightened of him. The animals, I mean. And he'll only ever help collect eggs, move the birds around, shear the sheep, that kind of thing. He won't help with the slaughter when the time comes for it. I am unable to bring harm to sentient creatures, he'll say with an apology. 
and there's no room for compromise on this. Fedder once fell right off the back of a moving tractor, fooling around as he was, dislocated his shoulder on impact with the ground. He begged Avdomat to crack it back into place to ease him of his suffering, and I don't doubt that the robot could have done it, if he'd been so inclined. But the answer to every whimpering plea was the same. I am sorry, Master Fedder. I am unable to bring harm to sentient creatures. So instead, he picked him right up and marched him the whole three miles back to the house, so Pa could take the boy to the doctor. He's a curious fellow, especially considering those three miles didn't seem at all that comfortable for poor Fedder to say the least. Our farm comprises the fields near the cliffside. On warm summer days, you can stand by the edge and look down at the waters, blue and frothing against the lit rocks below. You can watch the birds circle in the sky in the distance over the sea. The view's a little grayer at the present time. In the opposite direction, the fields stretch on and border the road, though it's more of a rough track really, and this leads down to the nearest town. It's from this direction now that I hear a call of a greeting, and I swivel to see a silhouette approach through the mist. I'm about to show back to my siblings, tell them to get Aftermath hidden away, but I realize, bitterly, that there ain't no point in this time. It's Max. As I mentioned earlier, until recently, around a week ago, our family were the only ones who knew about Aftermath's existence. But he was noticed by another, neighborhood boy by the name of Max. How he even saw the robot in the first place, I ain't sure. Though, if I was to guess, I should think the pervert was probably spying on me. Without wanting to sound arrogant, I just don't have any idea what else he could have possibly been doing, snooping around as he was. And he's made his interest in me pretty damned clear, especially since his discovery. It's never been laid out in any kind of straight terms, but the implication of Max's knowledge is tragically obvious. He holds us under the threat of blackmail, of snitching, of spilling the secret of Aftermath's presence here. Max is terrified of my father and avoids him where he can, but he ain't the slightest bit scared of Aftermath. He well knows about the robot's protocol. The boy is holding something now in his hand, a rock I think and he brings back his arm and hurls it hard through the air. I watch the rock fly over and hit Aftermath in the side of the head with a hard crack. Fedder and Yulia cry out in distress. Leave him alone, Max, you bully. I say to him, squaring my shoulders. Max only laughs, stepping close to me. He's a robot, Sophia. He don't give a shit, do you, robot? He calls. Aftermath does not reply only watches through the drizzle with those lamplight, watery green eyes. Max laughs again. He's a little melt pussy is all. Don't speak like that in front of the kids, Max, I reply coldly. What are you doing here? Can't I come see my favorite girl in the morning? He replies, leaning his face close to mine. I pull back and irritation flashes across his face. If only the boy would stand a little straighter, smile with a little less of that horrible sneer in his lips, he wouldn't look half bad, to be sure. But he don't. He never has, and he never will, I'd wager. And it's too late for that anyway. He's a rotten boy, rotten to the core, and I want nothing to do with him. I'm not sure how keen Max truly is to tell the town about the robot. If he were to do so, he would lose his bargaining chip and any power he had over me. But I wouldn't put it past him to tell regardless, out of sheer spite. So we play this nasty game, this back and forth. I swallow my pride and give the boy a reluctant kiss on the cheek. He smirks, renewed. That's better. He grins. Now come on, go and get dressed. I'm taking you out into town today. Max, I can't. You know I can't. I got work to do. It's a Saturday, he replies. What the hell are you talking about? 
Max, there's always work. This is a farm. I can't come up with you. I'm busy. The irritation returns to his face. You got a robot to do your work for you, don't you? He shoots a glance behind me at Aftermath. What's the matter? He broken or something? Since when were you so tormals? Stop thinking slow and come out with me. Max. He pushes forward and grabs my arm, roughly pulling me close to him. My siblings behind shout at him in anguish. I can hear their footsteps approach over the wet grass. It's all right, guys. I call back to them. Leave it be. You're a nasty bully. Yulia shouts at him, and I see Max's eyes leave mine and dart over my shoulder. And you're a pretty little thing, he says with a leer in his voice. I should think you'll grow up to look like your sister here one day. Maybe even prettier. Yulia's only ten, six years younger than I. I don't think Max would go near her. He's too afraid of my father. But I don't know. And that's what's scary. I just don't know. Leave her alone, Max, alright? I'm coming with you. I'll come into town. I mutter through clenched teeth. Andy releases me. That's better. He says. Now come on, the car's waiting. He shoots my sister a quick and obvious wink, then turns and strolls back through the mist and over the fields. I hate him. I turn to look at my siblings. They're holding tight to Aftermath's legs. My eyes meet the robots. They flash a bright green through the haze. The day in town is one rife with forced intimacy. It makes my skin crawl but I give a little ground and keep him placated. I let him put his hands around me. I let him kiss my cheek. But eventually, the day, as long as it is, comes to an end. At the break of the evening, he drops me off at the end of the road, and it's clear he's wanting something more. But I can't. I just can't. So I push him away. He flushes. He'd been building up to this all day, and I'd just gone and rejected him like it was nothing. His mouth twists, and I intercept, preemptively. Max, I say, as diplomatically as I can. Let's just... Look, you gotta give me a real chance to get to know you. It's too soon. It's been a week, Sophia. How much longer are you gonna... Max. I grit my teeth and put a hand on his arm. Take it slow. I'll see you soon, okay? But now I gotta get back. He chews his tongue. You haven't forgotten about tonight? I want you all pretty for me, too. None of these farm girl overalls. I take a step back. Tonight? Come on, Sophia. Tonight's the night your pa's away, remember? That's what you said. He had business in town. I was gonna bring over the alcohol and that picnic I planned. I breathe. My pa had thankfully cancelled his night away quite recently. I won't be seeing Max tonight. Sorry, Max. It's been cancelled. He's gonna be home after all. Sorry. Another time. Max clutches his fists. But I had everything prepared. I got all the food all made. Sorry. Another time. I force myself to wave and then quickly turn to leave striding over the field and along the fastest route back to the house. I don't turn back, but after a while I hear the car starting and driving steadily away. This ain't sustainable. I'm gonna have to come up with a proper plan of dealing with Max. This can't go on. The guy's gone from a nuisance to someone who really frightens me. He's warped in the head. I spend the evening, before it gets too dark, finishing up the work with Aftermath. He's strong. He can lift an entire bale of hay all by himself, and he never seems to get tired. I don't know what we'd do without him. I wonder idly, as I often do, what his purpose is. His true purpose. Can't be for carrying around bales of hay. Where did he come from? My train of wanderings is derailed when I push back into a farmhouse, calling for Pa, but finding only Yulia set drying at the kitchen table. He had to go out, Sophia, she says, looking up at me, worry writ across her face. Fetter is hurt. 
I freeze. What do you mean, Yulia? How hurt? Is he okay? What happened? He don't remember. He says one minute he was running by the corn. Next minute he was on the ground with blood streaming down his face and a headache like he's never had before. Anger rushes through me red hot. Max. Is he sure, Yulia? He sure he didn't see what happened? Yulia shakes her head. Reckons he must have tripped and banged his head. I close my eyes for a moment and force myself to steady my nerves, to cool my rage. Fetter ain't never fallen and banged his head in his whole life. Yulia continues. So, Pa's gone and rushed him to the doctors. Should be back later tonight, he's hoping at least. There's no way this is a coincidence. Max is dangerous then. This confirms it. He's a dangerous lunatic. A knock on the door sends goosebumps shooting up my arms. I turn to look in taut silence. We all do. The atmosphere changes at once, and the knock comes again. Ain't nobody gonna let me in? Comes Max's voice from beyond the door. I... Uh, of, of course, Max. I reply, thinking over my options. But it's too late. I've let him know that I'm here, and he pushes through into the room uninvited. Oh, my, my. You're still in your farm clothes. Didn't I tell you to get dressed? Max, I... How did you know that? Saw your Paul drive past in his truck. Figured he'd change his mind about that outing. Max's grin is cold and humorless, and shins a shiver down my spine. Why don't you go on upstairs and change up? I have plenty of company while I wait. The thought of leaving Max with Yulia even in the presence of Aftermat, and even for only a few minutes, the notion sends my pulse racing with anxiety. What? What's wrong with what I'm wearing now? You got a problem with my outfit? You look like a farm boy, Sophia. It ain't appropriate. I stand defiant. I have to. The grass might still be damp from this morning. I ain't getting any fine dress of mine ruined, not for you. Not for nobody. Now stop being so fussy and take me out for that starlight picnic, okay? There's a tense pause. All right, sure. He grumbles, relenting, and I take his arm. I shoot a pleading look at Aftermat as I turn to close the door behind me. Please, take care of Yulia, it says in its meaning. Aftermat nods in reply with a couple of soft clicks and the door draws closed. Max is breathing heavily as he leads us through the fields. He stumbles a little too. Max, I ask, have you been drinking already? How the hell did you drive here? Uh, just a little, he replies, reaching into his bag and pulling out a small bottle of vodka, half empty. He shakes it in his hand and the remaining liquid sloshes around but you ain't gonna grass on me, are ya? He laughs and plants a wet kiss on the side of my mouth. I shiver in disgust. He takes my hand in his as we walk through the night, the breeze gentle. We come to a stop on a scenic knoll not far from the cliffside. Now if this ain't one of the best views this side of the country, he murmurs. The clouds have cleared somewhat, and the stars and the moon shine bright, reflecting pretty in the slow rolls of the deep, dark blue of the sea beyond. I sure is, I reply quietly, the breeze picking up into a light wind, rustling my hair about my face. He sits down on the grass, opening his bag, pulling out a little basket of paroshki, bread buns with meat fillings. He takes one and starts munching, drawing out after them a new bottle of vodka this one unopened. Here, he says. Relax, have a drink. I sit with him, but I decline the alcohol. I'd better not, Max. Vodka ain't my drink anyhow. There is another pause. Vodka ain't your drink? He replies coolly. I swallow nervously. Yeah, that's right. And you didn't think to mention this to me at any point. Well, I... It 
just never really came up, I guess. A vein bulges in the side of his neck. He licks his upper teeth and then takes another swig from the bottle before holding the new one out to me. Not even one sip? You won't take one damned sip of vodka after knowing the trouble I went to to get it for you? F for us? I gently push the bottle away. I can't stand it, Max. I'm sorry. Max flushes at once and hurls the empty bottle at a rock at the edge of the cliff where it shatters. He swears loudly and makes me jump. He angrily grabs his bag, muttering to himself as he roots through it. Heart pounding, I reach out to him, try to placate him, and he pulls something from his bag. Looks like a length of rope. Before I can really process, however, he's on me. Heavier than he looks and holding me down. Quick as a flash, wrapping that rope around my arms, muttering and seething, stinging vodka dripping from his lips and onto my face. Max, stop! What the hell's gotten into you? Stop for Christ's sake, Max! But he does not. My panic rises desperately and feverishly. I'd always considered myself strong, someone who could handle themselves in a fight. But surprised like this? Suckered without a chance to fight back? I've lost already. I don't have a hope in hell. I scream and spit up into his face. He ignores me, grunting as he pushes and pulls me around, keeping me down with his legs, wrapping the rope tighter and tighter. He brings me up closer to him, so as to tie a knot in the back, and I take the opportunity to bite hard onto his ear. He cries out in pain and tears himself away, losing a piece of ear in a shower of blood in the process. He smacks me about the face and jumps behind me, tying the knot as I thrash hopelessly, kicking as hard as I can tiring sooner than I'd have expected, and after a beat, he binds together my legs. My screams give way to frustrated sobs. Max, you bastard! You just go on and let me go. Let me the fuck go. What's wrong with you? I gave you every chance, you stupid girl. He hisses, cracking open the new bottle and taking another mouthful. He stumbles past me and reaches down to grab the remaining half of his paroshki biting into the dough and chewing as he regards me with drunk and angry eyes. As he talks, he sprays me with spittle, with bits of flake and beads of vodka. I didn't want to do this. I really didn't. But otherwise, you'd have me waiting, and waiting with no end in sight. Max, you're drunk. Come on, please let me go. He crouches down and puts a hand on my cheek, stroking it. His hand is cold and sticky. And I cringe away from his touch. He takes another careless swig, eyes dark and stands up. He begins, with the fumbling motions of the intoxicated, to unbutton his pants. I scream, I struggle, and a voice cuts through the night from a little ways behind. Miss Sophia, would you care for any assistance? I force my body round, twisting my neck to see. Max turns likewise. Terror passes momentarily across his face, then vanishes at once, replaced with a laugh. <laughs> Your robot boyfriend's followed you out here, Sophia. He snorts, doubling over with that cruel laughter of his. The robot stands tall, little more than a silhouette, the light of the stars glinting fleetingly off his shinier gears, his eyes bright and aqua green. The long grass rustles in the rising wind about his feet. He cocks his head. Aftermath, help! Please restrain him! I am sorry, Miss Sophia. Aftermath replies with a clank and a little cloud of steam. I am unable to bring harm to sentient creatures. You ain't gonna do shit. Max slurs, stepping boldly up to the robot and shoving him hard in his chest. Aftermath takes a step back. Untie me, Aftermath! Get me out of these ropes! I call, squirming and sweating in panic. But as Aftermat makes to move towards me, Max staggers back a few steps, grabs a handful of broken glass and stuffs it into my mouth. A sharp edge cuts the inside of my lip, and I imagine he cuts himself too in the process. But he doesn't seem to care. Before I have the chance to spit it out, he has gagged me with a length of torn fabric, tying it round my head to keep it in place. The alcohol residue stings like fire in the cuts the glass makes in my cheeks. 
Max rises to a stand and points a shaking figure at Aftermath. Stay right there, robot. Stay right the fuck there. He takes another swig of vodka. You can't harm a sentient creature, that right? Well, you try and untie these ropes and you'll cause Miss Sophia a great deal of squirming and shifting. And that glass is gonna do a whole world of harm to her little mouth. So you keep your distance, alright? Aftermath stops with a clank and a hiss. He looks from me to Max, down to the ground, then back to Max. He cocks his head and his eyes flash. A gear in his chest turns, but the robot does not move. In fact, you know what? Max shouts, grabbing the last of his piroshki, taking a bite, sipping on another mouth of vodka to wash it down. You can turn your metal ass around, go back to the house and forget all about this robot, or I'm gonna hurt Sophia. I'm gonna hurt her a great- Max chokes suddenly and violently. He drops the bottle to the ground and doubles over, gagging. His throat convulses in the moonlight as he tries and fails to take in another breath. He tries to cough it up. He tries to force out a laugh, to indicate drunkenly that he is still in control. But the laughter does not come. He starts shaking his head. He staggers. He stumbles and tries to cough. Again. And again. It's a terrible, terrible noise. Violent and sick falls to the ground beside me, tries to untie my ropes in shaking hands, but he cannot do it. He cannot move fast enough. He can't make up his mind on the best course of action, and the clock is ticking. I can only watch wide-eyed. Max rises up and claws at his neck. His fingernails cut the flesh, and he falls to the ground a second time, crawling through the grass, grabbing hold of Aftermath's leg, pleading, begging, spluttering, and choking as he scratches at the metal with one hand and desperately kneads his throat with the other. Aftermath looks down at him dispassionately. <coughs> Max chokes, a wordless plea. His eyes begin to roll back up into his head. The wind blows through the grass. You seem to be in need of the Heimlich maneuver, Master Max. Says Aftermath, as two shimmering silver leaves from a faraway tree blow past his face. Unfortunately, the force of such a maneuver delivered by myself would likely result in the breaking of ribs. Aftermath's eyes flash a brighter and deeper green, shining gems in the darkness. And I am unable to bring harm to sentient creatures. Max's scream catches somewhere between his lungs and his throat. His chest contracts repulsively, and he scrambles drunkenly to his feet, stumbling. His legs carry him one direction. His torso tries to take him another. His oxygen-starved brain has lost control. The boy's eyes go white, and he falls. Tripping over his own feet, he collapses, dropping like a stone and off over the edge of the cliff. And just like that, he is gone. After Matt left after that to go and get help, Yulia came back with them and they set me free. The cuts on my inner cheeks sting and will for a while, but they ain't permanent, the doctor said. My pa rushed me there as soon as he returned with Fetter, poor man. Two trips in one night. Fetter, likewise, will be fine, by the way. No permanent harm done, just some stitches needed. It's Aftermath that I'm most worried about now. Everything ain't all wrapped up in a nice little bow. A boy has gone missing. The questions have begun spreading across town. The authorities have been involved. There's trouble brewing. My pa was beyond himself with rage when he found out what Max had been doing with me. Took a time to calm him down. He said that I should have gone to him the second the boy started causing trouble, and he would have beat the bastard black and blue. I don't know, maybe I should have done. I was just trying to protect my family. And going forwards, the evidence is stacked in my favor. It's a gamble, but we could pretty much tell the truth. 
that Max was a scoundrel who attacked me and drunkenly fell to his death. But we'd have to find some place secure to hide Aftermath away before any of their investigating if we do. I've caught sight of the robot through my bedroom window on more than one occasion since that night, far out and away, a little figure in the distance standing on the cliffside where Max fell to the rocks and the water below, staring silently out to sea. What's he thinking? If he's even thinking at all, is impossible to say. But regardless, for now at the least, we are safe. For now. I also have a comment here, made by user Copper and Lead, that lends a new perspective to the story. Perhaps you know this, but the world famous military rifle known as the AK 47 is short for Aftermat Kalishnikova, and the 47 refers to the year of manufacture. Many people also know that the AK 47 was developed primarily by one Mikhail Kalishnikov. Fewer people know that Kalishnikov was fairly torn about the proliferation of his weapon. He often stressed that he developed his rifle for the defense of his country and not for senseless killing. Still, as a devout Orthodox Christian, he once asked, If my rifle claimed people's lives, then can it be that I, a Christian and an Orthodox believer, was to blame for their deaths? Regardless, he was proud of the unrelenting reliability of his inventions. They require almost no maintenance. They last nearly forever. They are simple and effective machines that often perform beyond the sum of their simple parts. But he often expressed a desire to build agricultural machinery. In one article, he said, I'm proud of my invention but I'm sad that it is used by terrorists. I would prefer to have invented a machine that people could use and that would help farmers with their work. For example, a lawnmower. One of his first jobs was at a tractor repair facility. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that Avtomat was a creation of Kalushnikov. I think he created at least one example of his perfect machine. I think he made something that would make life easier for farmers, but to prevent misuse, like what happened with his rifle. I think he hardwired it so that it could never harm anything, for any reason, even to help another person. If you like the story, please like, comment, and subscribe. Or I might stare at you with my bright green eyes. If you prefer the podcast format, perfect! I have a podcast where I upload all the audio. I call it the Silver Threads Podcast. It's available on most popular platforms. If you want to suggest a story to read, or want to contact me for business purposes, email me at storiesforsilverthreads at gmail.com. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you next time with another story.